very much, Jamie. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here today and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and thank you so much to all the speakers who have agreed to, to speak. Um, I'm also happy not to be speaking for very long today and to pass it on to all sorts of people that you wouldn't have heard of, heard from, you would have heard of them, of course, because they're all um, very active in the conservation community in Canada. Um, but it's it's a chance today to hear from all sorts of people who've been contributing to the KBA process in different roles across the country. Uh, at this point, I am going to say what a key biodiversity area is in case there's anyone joining us who is new to this concept. So key biodiversity areas are something really specific. They're not just areas that are um, full of biodiversity in some sort of way. They're really, it's a quantitative approach to identifying sites that uh, contribute significantly to the persistence of biodiversity. And so, so it's a site scaled approach. Um, it captures things like threatened biodiversity, both species and ecosystems, uh, rare species and ecosystems, sites where species aggregate. So, for example, migratory stopovers or bat hibernacula or caribou calving grounds. So sites that are so important during a particular stage of the life cycle of a species, um, as well as sites of very high ecological integrity. And we'll be hearing about some of these sites today. We identify key biodiversity areas and we're about two years in now. Um, using a, a global key biodiversity area standard, which was developed with lots of testing over about 12 years and finally published in 2016. Um, and then also a national KBA standard, which was adapted in Canada um, by a number of experts that are probably here today uh, to make sure that when we're identifying key biodiversity areas, we're including um, biodiversity that is of high um, prior priority in Canada as well. So it's a great time to stop and reflect. As I mentioned, we were two years in. Uh, it's been a huge amount of work to date, um, and we're very proud of where we're at. And we haven't done everything perfectly because we really had to jump in and start doing the work right from the beginning, even before um, there were that too many models to follow in terms of how do you actually do this work. Um, and I have to say that the team that's, that's contributed to this work, um, we've really together developed the model for how to identify key biodiversity areas under a number of criteria uh, in a number of different kinds of conservation contexts and with as much participation as we've been able to manage. So we've learned a few things along the way. It's really complex work. At the beginning, there were so many different things to work out. You know, we had this wonderful KBA standard at the global scale and these very complete sets of guidelines. Um, and yet, because it hadn't really been tested out, this is very much a new tool globally. Um, there are still a lot of workflows, um, sort of how do you identify, you know, geographically restricted species? There's no lists for these things. So luckily we have an incredible conservation and biodiversity uh, community in Canada and people have been really stepping up and offering advice and support. We've also learned that it's very time consuming and it's costly as well. And this is if you want to do it right. And we're pretty dedicated to doing this in um, the best spirit possible. And we take a lot of uh, guidance from the Pathway to Canada Target One process, which is how we got our start two years ago. And, and so this is really taking into consideration all the provinces and territories, federal government, municipal jurisdictions, indigenous government and leadership, and trying to be participatory and listen to what's needed and how, how to do this work within particular contexts. So we've taken a regional approach to be able to do that. So that the to do this correct, there's a lot of outreach needed. There's a lot of training needed as well, um, because this is a new concept and people need to know well, what is it? How do you do it uh, in order to be able to participate effectively? There's um, we needed to develop to develop re uh, regional leadership as well, and we've we've had fantastic people leading processes within the re the regions, as well as advisors and government representatives who've provided advice and and support along the way. It's it's costly. We are the budget sort of, and I can only talk for about part of the budget, but it's you know upwards of seven hundred thousand dollars a year, and almost all of that goes to the salaries of the regional coordinators, the the secretariat staff. Um, to people, the people who are doing this work, advisors as well. There's ton, there's been tons of workshops, consultations, multiple review stages. All of this has taken way longer than we initially thought, but it's really important to make sure that everyone has a chance to learn what a KBA is and provide information and input into the scientific and consultative process of, of developing and delineating these sites. 
We've also learned that we don't have enough data for many species and ecosystems to identify key biodiversity areas. So we have lists of thousands of potential KBA trigger species and ecosystems, uh, and we've been able to identify many, use, but only where there's sufficient data. So we're also hoping to help identify what are the species and data needs going forward so that we can identify all KBAs into the future. And so where there is data and knowledge, we're making incredible progress, and that's thanks to the expertise and the generosity of the broad KBA uh, community. So thanks to all of you. We've made progress, and I'm not going to get into this in detail. I've, I've talked about this before, but on governance of this um, initiative, uh, we have a management committee that has uh, uh, participation from a number of organizations in government. Uh, we have quite a few um, partnerships, both with academic institutions, again, governments and all sorts of um, organizations. We've developed a lot of infrastructure for consistency, for um, information capture, because it's going to be important as we go forward to make sure that we know exactly what was done, what went into um, each KBA, who was involved, what rationale there was for delineating a site, etc. Um, so we've also adapted tools for Canada specifically. I've mentioned the national KBA standard it comes along with a national proposal form. Um, we've developed workflows and we, we've recently developed a KBA Canada wiki to help people who want to identify KBAs. It's not ready for sharing yet. And so and then finally, we have tons of knowledge, experience and capacity now across the country. We want more, um, but we're, we're really getting to a stage where we can go full speed ahead. Uh, we've ad advanced. Um, work um, quite a lot in about seven provinces and territories. We're in early stages in six others. We've had many workshops. We have 240 plus. I think Jamie told me there's 255 new KBAs identified and she'll go through those. We have 500 plus legacy IBAs that have been reassessed using the KBA standards. Uh, 192 are confirmed to be KBAs that are triggered by birds and we're working to, uh, Birds Canada is working to develop information on the rest of them with partners across Canada. Uh, Nature Surf Canada has led the charge to, to uh, generate 1,254 EBAR range maps, um, and they're in the process of making sure that they're all reviewed and published with associated spatial data. So, the, and there's a lot of other products too that I won't get into, but you'll you'll see some of them today. We do have some remaining challenges and next steps. Um, so we have a few regional gaps that we need to to fill, to fill. Whenever we secure funding, then we're able to hire one more person to lead work. So we're looking at Manitoba right now, for example, as a as a huge priority because we've started work there. We need to continue, and there's lots of interest from the conservation community there. We need to now address ecosystem criteria. We've just hired Lucy Poli, an ecosystem criteria coordinator, to to lead this work. So I think that we're going to make fantastic progress in the in the next year um, with the involvement of Stephen Woodley, who has led the ecosystem um, work uh, to date. Um, and we'll also learn about Criterion C, led by Juan Zuluaga. And we're integrating new KBAs that overlap with legacy IBAs, and that's complex work. So we, that's also a priority for the year to come, working with Birds Canada, as well as nature, um, and BC Nature, for example, in some in, in BC, where um, you know there's a lot of interest in, in that particular task. And then finally, we, we hope to speed things up now that we're, kind of, as I said, full speed ahead. Um, there's a huge demand for these products. I'm getting emails all the time from with government departments and planning departments, um, IPCA uh, development proposals, wondering whether there's information that for, about KBAs that can feed into these processes. That's fantastic, and we just want to be able to provide that output, and we don't have it quite ready yet, but we, we, it, we're almost there in many different regions. So I just want to leave it at that for now, and I'm going to leave you with a wonderful array of speakers. I want to thank our generous donors that have made this possible. Um, and I also want to thank KBA Canada, and you'll have to probably read this slide when you when you get a, a copy of, of the presentations if you're interested, but we've had the most incredible set of uh, regional coordinators who are all listed there, uh, who've really learned and pioneered a lot of the methods for identifying key biodiversity areas. Our secretariat across WCS Canada, Birds Canada, and Nature Surf Canada is just stellar, uh, and we're learning how to work together better and better every day. We have postdocs and PhDs, incredible advisors who have such a depth of experience, the wonderful management committee, the Pathway to Canada Target One Secretariat and National Steering Committee, the provincial and territorial focal points, and the conservation data centers. These are all just integral to the process. And then just there's there's more, so I can't list you all. So to all the members of the KBA 
Canada Coalition and anyone that has helped us to identify sites that are important to the persistence of biodiversity in Canada. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Kira. Okay, can you see my presentation okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Give me one sec, sorry about that. So Kira gave us a really great brief overview. I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically about where we're at with our new KBAs. Uh, straight to the punchline, we have about 255 new sites identified for the species criteria. And I'll talk about the other types of criteria in a moment. And so you can see the distribution of these sites here. The way we're doing the KBA work, again, as Kira mentioned, the majority of the KBA work to date has been to identify sites in regional initiatives. So biodiversity data and expert knowledge is central to the process of identifying and proposing KBAs as sites. We work with local governments, Indigenous people, scientists, and experts to ensure that we're using the best available data. Regional work also allows experts to direct a process that's going to be most relevant in each region, and it gives them first-hand experience with KBAs, increasing the legitimacy and the credibility of the resulting information and building trust in the data that they're given that can be applied to conservation efforts in various jurisdictions. So next, I'm going to show you a series of maps um, that are going over how work is progressing in different regions across the country for different criteria. Um, so first, I'm showing you here uh, work to identify new KBAs for species criteria. So that is for threatened and geographically restricted species. And as uh, um, you can see here, in the dark green are areas or regions where the identification sites of sites is nearly complete for these criteria. Um, in the medium green is areas that we're still working on this and have sites in progress. And in the lightest green are areas where we've identified a couple pilot sites, but there's still a lot of work to be done to do scoping and identify additional sites that will be KBAs for the species criteria. And finally, in the hatched regions, you can see some of the areas where we still need to do some fundraising to complete the work. In Yukon, uh, we have identified a set of sites that's likely close to all of the sites for this, these criteria in that area. Same with in Atlantic Canada, we've nearly identified all of the sites for species um, based on the data we have available right now. Um, Ex Atlantic Canada being New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and PEI, excluding Newfoundland and Labrador for now. In British Columbia, Riley Pullum was our regional coordinator, and he identified approximately 80 sites. And Riley has now left us to move to a full-time job in the United States. So we've hired a new regional coordinator, Ian Adams, and Ian will be continuing the work in British Columbia to identify new KBAs so based on species criteria. Uh, moving back up north in the Northwest Territories, Maria Leung, who led the work in Yukon, has identified a few pilot studies, or sorry, a few pilot sites. And we have work planned to continue to sco do scoping work for sites in both Northwest Territories and Nunavut. In Alberta and Saskatchewan, we have identified a few pilot sites that were based on a thematic initiative we did to identify freshwater sites across the country. So there are a few freshwater sites in those provinces, but uh, a large scale scoping of a complete set of sites still needs to be done. And luckily we have secured some funding and we will be hiring somebody uh, who will hopefully start to um, move that work forward before the fall. 
In Manitoba, like Kira mentioned, we have started the work and that was mostly in the uh, southern prairie portion of the province and led by Karen Newman. Karen has now also moved on to a new position and there's still a lot of work to be done in Manitoba. And as Kira also mentioned, a lot of appetite for the work to be done by the conservation community there, especially in the north of the province. In Ontario, work is just beginning in earnest. So we have uh, Robin Rumney, who has started as our new Ontario coordinator. And Robin just hosted a kickoff meeting last week to start connecting with experts and people who want to be involved in this process. And if you want to be involved but weren't able to make that meeting, feel free to get in touch with us and we can um, send you more information. Work is ongoing in Quebec. Uh, I won't speak too much about that right now because Kim Gauthier-Champert, who is our Quebec coordinator, is on the call and she'll be talking about that later on in this session. And finally, in Newfoundland and Labrador, there's been some initial scoping work done, and that was by Sarah Robinson and Caitlin Porter, who both worked for the Atlantic Canada Conservation Data Centre. Uh, Sarah Robinson also led the work in the rest of Atlantic Canada and has now moved on to a new position, and uh, Caitlin Porter will be taking over that portfolio. Um, but again, as you can see by the cross-hatching right now, we don't have the funding to push forward uh, to complete that work in Newfoundland and Labrador as well. So that is for uh, sites identified using the species criteria. In terms of ecosystem criteria, uh, here is a map for how that work is going for criteria A and B. So again, that's for threatened and geographically restricted ecosystem types. Now, you probably haven't heard quite as much from us about ecosystem criteria, and that's in part because it's a lot harder to apply who we're finding than the species criteria. That's partly because ecosystems require an understanding of where each fits within a standardized ecosystem classification system, similar to how we have different rankings for species at risk. And we do have multiple uh, ecosystem classification systems in use across Canada, but they need to be aligned with one another and with international classification systems. And so Stephen Woodley from IUCN and who's part of the KBA Canada Management Committee has been developing the ecosystem criteria work with collaborators across Canada and with NatureServe. Scoping work to identify ecosystem sites has been completed in the Prairie Provinces, uh, led by Pat Comer of NatureServe and Stephen Woodley. But sites identified by the scoping work still need to be ground truthed and to receive input from experts to move forward with a delineation and proposal of those sites as KBAs. Work to do scoping for ecosystem criteria is underway in British Columbia with plans to work in Ontario and Nova Scotia, with the latter being led by Sean Baskill and the Nova Scotia government with our support. Next, here is a map of our scoping work for Criterion C. Criterion C is for large sites with the highest ecological integrity within an ecoregion. So we have plans to begin scoping for these sites um, that meet this criteria in northern BC, Ontario, and Quebec to start, and that process is going to be coordinated by Lucy Poli. Uh, work is going to start in these places, but there's also potential for Criterion C sites in other northern areas uh, that Juan Zuluaga will talk about more later on in this session. And finally, in addition to these broad regional approaches that we're doing, uh, we have a number of thematic initiatives underway. So as Kira mentioned, there's a big push to crosswalk all of the existing important bird and biodiversity areas to KBAs, and we're doing that in partnership with Birds Canada. We also had a, as I mentioned, a freshwater initiative to identify freshwater sites across the country, and that's with support from the IUCN, freshwater experts, and the conservation data centers. There is work being done to explore compatibilities between key biodiversity areas and biocultural values. And that was started by Jeff Wall with the Guelph, with Guelph University and the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership. And finally, there's also marine pilot KBAs being led by WWF Canada. 
So in terms of species, um, here's just a very quick overview of some of the different taxa we are capturing by these species criteria in KBA site proposals. Um, a large part of them are plants, uh, also fish and insects. Again, this work is still very, very much ongoing in many, many places. And so I anticipate that this will fill out a bit. Plants tend to be easier to identify KBAs for because they stay in one place, or they're easy to have good data for and to delineate. Um, and so I suspect that some of the other taxa will be filling out as we gain more experience and uh, more data. So finally, there are all these new KBAs. I'm sure you want to know where to find information about them. Uh, some information can be found on our website for Sites in Progress. Uh, this is a screenshot from an interactive map that was built by Meg Southey from WCS Canada. And it shows the coordinate points of sites that are in progress across the country. And for some of those points, it'll tell you the information about which species uh, triggered that KBA. But as Kira mentioned, the proposal process for KBAs, especially how we're doing this in such a participatory way and trying to do it right, it can take a really long time. So KBA proposals have to undergo both a technical review stage once the proposal is put together and the site's delineated, where experts take a look at it and comment on the data quality and things like that. And then it also undergoes a general review stage where anybody else that has an interest in the site and wants to provide information or has some kind of input is then able to do so. We have one pilot site uh, for trial islands in British Columbia that is complete. Uh, it has been, it is a global level KBA and has been approved by the Global Secretariat. So you can find information about that site on the World Database of KBAs. We have our own database of KBAs that's in development that Andrew Couturier will talk a little bit more about. And I hope that gives you some flavor of the work that's going on across the country and the huge number of people that have been involved in this work and that we have to thank for moving this forward. Thank you. Okay, has Courtney joined us? She has, uh, but she's unable to unmute, so she may have used um, a different link. I've sent nope, her. I sorry, I can unmute her. Okay, super. If I can find her. Oh, hi, Courtney. Um, just give me one second. There you are. You should be able to unmute yourself now, Courtney. Um, so next up, we will be getting a federal government perspective on KBAs from Courtney Robertson, who is the head of the Pathway to Canada Target One Secretariat at Environment and Climate Change Canada. Thank you so much, Jamie. Hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, as mentioned, I'm Courtney Robertson. I'm actually here today to present on behalf of the Pathway to Canada Target One initiative. So it's an initiative that involves all levels of governments in Canada, including Indigenous governments and peoples. And my angle on the topic of key biodiversity areas today focuses on the story of how KBA became a priority in the Pathway to Canada Target One initiative. So Jamie, I believe you have the slides and we're going to put them up on the screen. One moment. Thank you very much. Okay, there you go. Perfect, so we can jump to the second slide, please. So I'll start with some quick context on what I'll likely be referring to as the pathway. Uh, in recognition of a need for coordinated action, federal, prov provincial, and territorial ministers responsible for parks, protected areas, conservation, wildlife, and biodiversity launched the Pathway to Canada Target One initiative in the summer of 2017. And this was done to put in place the necessary community of people to achieve the terrestrial and inland water portion of Canada Target One. Uh, 
Uh, this initiative is co-led by a provincial government and the federal government, and we're fortunate to have representatives participating in the initiative from nearly all provinces and territories, the Métis National Council, the Assembly of First Nations, as well as representatives from local government and, and the Canadian Parks Council. We also have had partners who have provided a broad variety of perspectives and inputs, including environmental and government organizations, Indigenous peoples, academics, youths, etc. And all of these people are working together to not only focus on the number 17%, but to help address the big challenges in area-based conservation. So protecting the right amount of area, protecting the right places to optimize benefits for biodiversity, and doing so in the right ways. Next slide, please. So as this initiative started to get off the ground, partners agreed to state a goal and a suite of principles that would guide the work over the next few years. They also recognized the need to broaden participation as well as the need to link these efforts to reconciliation between Indigenous peoples and all Canadians. Next slide. Well, Pathway is obviously focused on Canada Target 1, the first of Canada's 19 biodiversity targets. It's important to keep in mind that uh, Canada Target 1 is based on IG Target 11, and that target provides further details on what we refer to as the quality elements. So while not explicitly stated in Canada Target 1, these quality elements are considered as part of the efforts in the Pathway Initiative. So as you'll see on the screen, as noted in blue, uh, one of these quality elements highlights the need to focus on areas of particular importance for biodiversity. Next slide. So early within Pathway, uh, expert task teams were convened to explore options for addressing each of these quality elements as listed in IG Target 11. And these teams produced options papers that were provided to the national bodies developing recommendation, recommendations. So the Indigenous Circle of Experts and the National Advisory Panel. Um, I actually chaired the team responsible for developing an option paper on areas important for biodiversity and ecosystem services. And as I'm not an expert on the topic, uh, I luckily was able to draw together many people from across the country to collaborate on this and a lot of expertise. And of the options provided, there was a clear front runner for identifying areas important for biodiversity. And you can see this reflected on the screen here in the National Advisory Panel's report uh, with the recommendation to not only identify global key biodiversity areas in Canada, but also to adapt the global standard to the national context. Next slide. So building on the work of the two pathway national advisory bodies, so that Indigenous Circle of Experts and National Advisory Panel, the body responsible for leading the pathway initiative, the National Steering Committee, released the interjurisdictional One with Nature report. And this is truly a report by federal, provincial, territorial departments responsible for conservation, wildlife, and biodiversity. And it highlights shared priorities and aspirational actions to advance Canada Target One. And you'll see priority three in the report speaks to maximizing conservation outcomes and includes aspirational actions such as the need to develop pan-Canadian criteria and indicators for monitoring, tracking, and reporting progress on the qualitative elements of Canada Target One. So given that, as we all know, there's never enough money, capacity, or time to work on everything you'd like to all at once, uh, the Pathway National Steering Committee decided to prioritize which quality elements to advance first. And this was decided based on which would help inform decisions on where to direct on-the-ground conservation action and to build on work already underway to help create early wins and encourage continued action. Uh, as such, uh, focus was turned to key biodiversity areas, ecological representation, and connectivity. I'll note as well that the other two topics prioritized for early advancement were accounting, which is basically what counts towards 17% target and how to count it, as well as supporting and enabling uh, Indigenous protected and conserved areas. Next slide. So based on this prioritization of key biodiversity areas, several things happened. Uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada on behalf of Pathway directed funding to help kickstart collaborative KBA efforts in Canada. Uh, a partnership developed between Pathway and what would become the Canadian KBA Coalition. And this means that KBA leaders in Canada were regularly providing updates and seeking feedback from the Pathway National Steering Committee, uh, which of course created a sense of joint investment and ownership in this work. Uh, the necessity of better understanding not only which areas of global importance for biodiversity in Canada, uh, sorry, not only <laughs> which areas are of global importance for biodiversity in Canada, but also which are of national importance uh, was also highlighted through this work and a Canadian KBA standard was developed. Uh, and through all of this, the engagement of governments across Canada in the key biodiversity areas community started to grow, along with greater awareness at a variety of levels. 
For example, efforts on KBA and other quality elements were brought to federal, provincial, territorial deputy ministers responsible for uh, conservation, wildlife, and biodiversity on multiple occasions over the years. And this was to keep them apprised on plans, progress, and ultimately to keep them aware of the work. And at meetings such as those, we very often heard emphasis on the importance of advancing work focused on improving the quality of conservation efforts. Next slide, please. So needless to say, all of the five topics prioritized for immediate advancement through Pathway um, most followed the traditional working group format, as you can see on the screen. However, the key biodiversity efforts were truly developed to advance as a partnership with the Canadian KBA coalition. And this model was effective due to the coalition's excellent communication, collaboration, and a true desire to create this sense of joint ownership. Next slide. So that's it for my story of how key biodiversity areas were prioritized within the pathway initiative and this sense of creating a joint ownership and collaboration moving forward. I'm happy to, I don't know if we're leaving questions till the end or if we're taking them between presentations. I think we'll leave the bulk of the questions to the end. If there are any things that are really pressing, we can take them now. Um, okay. But thank you, Courtney. Next up, we are going to hear a British Columbia government perspective, and this is from Louise Blight, who is a senior biologist, resource objectives, ecosystem branch at the BC Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy, and an adjunct professor at the University of Victoria. Thank you, Louise. We're waiting for the sharing to happen. Oh, we saw it for a moment there and then it went away. Yeah, it's coming back. Here we go. Perfect. Thank you. OK, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. And uh, I'm pleased to be presenting to you from the traditional territories of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations this morning. I'm going to be talking about how KPAs can be used at a provincial level in BC, and I say can be used because while the programs I'm going to be describing here are underway, um, many of them are new and where KBAs can play a role is still an open question. And of course, KBAs um, are still in development. But the take home message here is, is that there's lots of potential for KBAs to be used at a practical on the ground level in BC. And so to talk about that I'm going to step back a little bit and provide some context on current direction related to biodiversity in British Columbia. So government priorities in general are increasingly being guided by um, mandate letters. So those are letters from a prime minister or a premier to their cabinet ministers and, and BC is no different there. So um, the mandate letters in question with the current administration are from their 2017 term and the most recent one ones from 2020 are guiding core ministry work and that includes in the so-called natural resource ministries so um for uh, and so these these all provide some opportunities to use kbas in a, in a range of programs and so for example in the uh, Minister of Environment's mandate letter for 2020. There is a bullet that says continue to work with partners to protect species at risk and work collaboratively with other ministries to protect and enhance BC's biodiversity. And then from the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural uh, Resource Operations and Rural Development, the, one of the longest ministry names in the world, their, um, their mandate letter from 2017 <clears throat> excuse me, had a bullet that said modernize land use planning and sustainably manage BC's ecosystems, etc. And then that same ministry in uh, 2020 has another, th their mandate letter, that minister's mandate letter has another bullet that um, reads develop and invest in new strategies aimed at better protecting our shared wildlife and habitat corridors 
including work to implement the Together for Wildlife strategy. And this strategy is something that came out again of the 2017 mandate letter where there was a bullet talking about how that ministry should undertake steps to improve management of wildlife habitat and, and wildlife itself. So therefore, these directions are all creating several active work streams where KBAs have the potential to be quite helpful. So one of those is modernized land use planning. Um, the previous slide, I mentioned land use planning from the 2017 mandate letter, and that's um, now an active stream of work. It's something that needs data inputs, and it sounds like something like KBAs that roll out multiple biodiversity related layers into a into a single product that's relatable could really be useful there. And um, then again, with Together for Wildlife, one of their goals is that stewardship actions achieve ta tangible benefits for wildlife with an action of developing new tools and actions to ensure wildlife um, stewardship responds to the needs of British Columbian shifting priorities and a changing climate. And Furthermore, that same strategy has another action that commits to making investments to manage existing conservation lands and acquire new priority lands. And again, this is this is work that's ongoing. And this one's particularly timely because the Office of the Auditor General in British Columbia has just audited the conservation lands program. And you can see the finding of that audit in a nutshell in the headline of this article here, which is that BC has not effectively managed the conservation lands program to conserve important habitats in BC. The way that these audits work is that the Auditor General, uh, uh, their office will take a couple of years to evaluate a program, then they'll come out with their findings, and those findings include um, a number of recommendations for how government can um, address any shortcomings that are found. And in this case, uh, the British Columbia government has accepted all the recommendations of this report. And uh, one of them is related to, to um, recommending that staff work with conservation partners to establish a shared list of priority habitats for the program. So it looks like there again, KBAs may be able to be a tool to play a role in helping to rank sites for the conservation lands program. And then apart from work that's happening through direction from these mandate letters, there are of course other important areas of work that are um, being carried out in BC, both through the province and outside of it. Uh, a couple of examples of this are Pathway to Canada Target 1, which we just heard about through Courtney. BC is on the National uh, Steering Committee and in fact co-chairs it. And um, KBAs are supported there by some participating jurisdictions, in, including by BC and, of course, the federal government as a way, a key way to make to meet commitments again, which we've just heard about from Courtney. Another area where the, the KBAs can play a role is, is in local governments, and they have the ability to identify important areas for biodiversity, or not identify them, but to recognize them in things like official community plans and other planning tools. So, for example, important bird areas, which we've just heard are in the process of being crosswalked to KBAs, have been used for quite a long time by local governments to inform their planning processes. Uh, a spe specific ex example of this is that the Comox IBA on central Vancouver Island is recognized by official community plans of the communities that it spans in the area. So, KBAs can help, therefore, with conservation planning at the regional at a regional level, and that's that has the, the ability to be quite impactful because, of course, that's the level at which a lot of development uh, decisions are are made in the province and in the country. So, some conclusions: uh, where KBAs are going to be used remains to be seen, of course, but there are lots of opportunities that are presenting themselves and. KBAs can be a, a key analytical layer to help inform priorities in BC. And then more generally, what I'm hearing from people when I when I talk to them about key KBAs and how they can be used is a lot of interest in learning more about them. So about the process, particularly a lot of interest about the, the data layers that go into these uh, designations and decisions, whether they're compatible with the sort of processes that are in place. 
And then also, obviously, people are interested in where these potential KBAs are or where, where they will be uh, in large part so that they can apply them in their work. So um, again, the take home message is there's lots of potential here for using KBAs in, in BC and uh, people are really excited by the opportunities that they present, it seems. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Okay, so moving forward, next we have a Nova Scotia government perspective and Dave McKinnon will be speaking to us and Dave is a systems planning coordinator for the protected areas branch of the Nova Scotia Department of Environment and Climate Change. Go ahead, Dave. Um, can you see my screen now, Jamie? Yes, uh, it's not in full screen, not presenting yeah. yet. Okay, I asked it to do that. Oh, here we go. All right. Um, yeah, so thanks. Uh, thanks for the invite and um, hi, and hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, so I'm just going to um, just kind of update on Nova Scotia's progress on KBAs, but uh, Mentioned first that uh, I did the least amount of work of anybody on this title slide. So Sarah Robinson, uh, formerly an ecologist with the with the Atlantic Canada Conservation Data Center, did uh, did all all the delineation work, and uh, Sean Baskell was the expert uh, provincial uh, lead on the work. Uh, much more conscientious than me. So. Um, Anyway, I just want to hand out that credit because uh, it's deserved to those those folks. Uh, so yeah, like uh, some people like to start out with a cartoon. I like to start out with a nice spreadsheet, and um, this just is a, is sort of the starting point for the delineation, and that's the identification of the species that, that are the, the trigger species for Nova Scotia. So uh, Sarah was supported by. Um, the uh, KBA Canada team and NatureServe Canada and the CD and this the Atlanta Canada CDC in, in uh, pulling this information together to uh, and then transform it into uh, into uh, kind of a viewable uh, you know map where at, at, where combined with uh, kind of combing through the data to see like do we, you know and, and comparing our occurrences to those elsewhere, um, you know, do we have any potential for um, for these trigger species to have uh, to meet to meet uh, the criteria? So it was a lot of background work, and um, you know, the, those two slides don't give any sense of how much work it is. But uh, in any case, uh, uh, so. Then Sarah did um, initial uh, delineations, and um, Sean and I and uh, and uh, other colleagues from Plants and Forestry um, in Nova Scotia um, reviewed some of those more problematic delineations uh, before they went out to uh, to other re review uh, by other experts. So Sarah and and Kira. Um, Held a webinar uh, last summer and got really good uptake. Uh, I think uh, it's up close to 60, 60 people participated. Um, a lot of taxonomic experts, and um, so that was uh, that was we had good engagement from uh, expert reviewers. Uh, kind of kicked off by that process, and uh, presented um, basically um, examples of the. Kind of approaching 40 uh, species based KVAs that have been identified in Nova Scotia to date. So we have some, you know, ones that are fairly easy to delineate because they meet. Um, they meet the criteria uh, on a number of fronts uh, and they're out in the middle of the ocean and there's uh, it's really easy to delineate those ones and they're also part of uh, existing protected areas. So that's an easy example. Had another, you know, other examples where uh, an IBA uh, had to be reevaluated, and it was, uh, you know, this Briar Island um, kind of had a basis for IBAs being uh, the large collection of phalaropes that, that congregate there in the fall. But on the land, it was uh, it was a it was a rare uh, mountain avens that was the trigger. 
So that that one kind of stood up as uh, is standing up as the original IVA delineation. Uh, another one uh, fell nicely within an existing national park, so that became the boundary. Uh, another one was was purely aquatic, so uh, a, a set of lakes that uh, host a very rare fish, and um, so we just had to figure out how to buffer that, and that that guidance was provided. And then another more con uh, confusing example where, um, you know, you're looking at the distributions of various species and wondering, okay, what's you know how far out do we go from these occurrences, and what uh, what do we create as ecologically relevant boundaries so that uh, some of these were more difficult to go through than others. So in the end, um, these are the, uh, the delineations so far, and there are still uh, data gaps, as was mentioned earlier, um, where other species might might be triggers, but there aren't sufficient data right now. You can see the, the element occurrences don't all fall neatly within those KBAs, so they're uh, from a conservation planning perspective, there are still occurrences that are not um, not within KBAs, but um, you know uh, are still useful to know about from conservation planning, you know other other conservation planning lenses. So he here's a list of the ones done so far um, in the in Atlantic Canada, and the ones that are uh, the ones that are are in blue are. Um, are linked to reports that are available for review right now. Um, and the other ones, I think I think Sarah is working on getting those up um, for review. So we're, I, I guess, you know, uh, others can correct me, but we're at that stage of uh, expert and stakeholder review. And I don't I don't believe stakeholder review has uh, has happened, but uh, it's, I think it's in the process of expert review. Um, a couple of things I want to mention. Um, the way we were able to get going relatively quickly on this was by working with the Atlanta Canada Conservation Data Center. So, um, uh, KBA Canada was able to funnel money to the to this ACCDC. The ACCDC is is uh, kind of well regarded as a very competent um, conservation data center in which all the provinces are. Partners, contributing partners, but it's a it, but it's an NGO, um, so it it uh, it can make decisions independent independently of uh, politics that might arise in any particular jurisdiction. So, so the work was able to get underway um, without having uh, and, and without having to uh, have approval of any particular jurisdiction before it began, and that I think helped in making uh, making the process seem more like um, inevitable. And it got the uh, provincial um, knowledge holders to uh, be able to participate um, on the basis of trying to improve the products, and and it didn't uh, put any province, um, you know, in a in a in a seat with two hands on the steering wheel and a foot on the brake. So I think uh, that approach worked well in our case. Um, as mentioned earlier, the ecosystem work. Sean Baskell is uh, is uh, planning. How, how to do that. I, I don't know, Sean, if you want to jump in. Otherwise, uh, I'll just leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you, Dave. And Sean, and if you would like to chime in, we can have uh, time for that during the Q&A period. Okay. Um, next, we're going to hear about the KBA assessment at the regional scale in Quebec by Kim Gauthier Champer, who's a professionnel de recherche programme BIOS, Projet Zonclé pour la Biodiversité Coordinatrice au Québec at Université de Sherbrooke. And I will share your presentation for you, Kim. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so, hi, I'm Kim Gautzis-Kampa. Thanks for presenting me, Jane. 
so I'm working at the University of Sherbrooke and I'm going to talk to you today about the Quebec uh, Initiative. Um, as Jamie told, uh, told you also, I'm leading the uh, Quebec Initiative to identify uh, the key BAs and um, I'm also working on other projects that I will uh, talk about very uh, quickly in the in the presentation. Next slide, please. So first of all, I wanted to put the um, KBA project in Quebec into context because uh, unlike in other provinces where the initiative is uh, being developed in a governmental setting, here in Quebec, uh, we are uh, the work is being realized in a university context. So uh, the um, initial motivation for the collaboration between uh, the University of Sherbrooke and the KBA project and WCS is because uh, we uh, are developing a réseau d'observation de la biodiversité du Québec. This is a network uh, for uh, observation of biodiversity in Quebec. I will now call it BDQC, so it's a bit shorter. Uh, this uh, project uh, aim at, uh, the, at uh, documenting the state of biodiversity and uh, its change in real time. So it is uh, creating a um, database about a biological um, um, species, about a biological, but sorry, biodiversity data and IT infrastructure and uh, visualis visualization tools. Um, and the vision of that network is to develop an open and transparent biodiversity mon monitoring system that places the knowledge about the biodiversity data at the center of society debates and decision making. So because the vision of um, this uh, project and the vision of the KBA project it is so um, close together, the collaboration became uh, natural. So um, there was an interest in sharing uh, data, knowledge, expertise. So uh, this is how the, the KBA identification project uh, arrived here at the University of Sherbrooke. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is the, the organigram of that network um, talking um, I was talking about the BDQC network. So there is a central hub, uh, a university uh, based central hub of the project here in Sherbrooke, uh, founded through uh, NSERC uh, Alliance program. And there is also another central hub um, in, um, based in the government of Quebec. So those two, um, those two. Uh, those two central hub uh, works together with a lot of partners. Uh, the network has partner um, in the academic sector, in the private sector, in uh, with the, with some conservation organization, in the data uh, science uh, organizations, and also in other organization working on the field like uh, national parks and uh, indigenous communities. Um, we also uh, are linking to some um, training program uh, to train students about um, uh, technical methods to uh, that can be used in uh, biodiversity um, science. So the uh, a strength for the KBA project to be part of that network is because uh, we. Um, the project the project has uh, access to a lot of partners and um, we hope uh, the KBA initiative will be uh, shared and relayed to the partners and hopefully uh, its its use will be encouraged. Um, next slide, please. So um, yeah, as I mentioned, WCS and the KBA project is member of uh, that BDQC network. It is also a partner of the bias to training program, um, training program in um, numerical ecology that uh, focus, focus on the training uh, graduate, undergraduate and graduate students um, 
about novel technologies in uh, data science uh, applied to uh, biodiversity science. So through that uh, training program, we um, there is an ongoing PhD uh, project on tools for identifying QBAs. There are also internships uh, for under, undergraduate and graduate students. And with the pool of uh, fellows that are in this program, we have a very uh, nice technical expertise in uh, computational ecology that we can uh, use for the QBA project. So all those projects are based at the University of Sherbrooke in the Integrative Ecology Lab, um, directed by Professor Dominique Harden. So the project I'm working on is the actual identification of KBA for species or sites that are uh, well documented. Uh, I am working with uh, research assistants uh, that are uh, doing most of the technical work. So um, Alexandre Martineau, which uh, couldn't be there today, but uh, is really doing all a lot of data gathering, identifying sites and filling out the proposal. So if uh, you have question on specific sites, I might uh, really, um, I might transfer that your question to him. Next slide, please. So in Quebec, the work is focusing uh, on species specific to criteria, like in um, most of the work being done uh, with the other regional coordinator right now. Um, so we have identified, we are identifying KBAs based on uh, three ma main criteria, the A1 criteria, which are site with threatened species, the B1 criteria, which are site with the geographically restricted species, and D criteria, which are sites important for biological processes of species. And we are uh, identifying global and national KBAs which I won't uh, explain the difference. I think uh, we had an explanation earlier about that. Next slide, please. So the main source of data is uh, the element occurrence from uh, the Centre de Données sur le patrimoine naturel du Québec, which is the Conservation Data Center for Quebec. Uh, element occurrence, for those of you that might not know it, it's um, an area that has been uh, identified that comprise an uh, observation point and um, the habitat around uh, the local population. So it might be few observation points and the habitat around it. So uh, since we are using those data initially, we thought, oh, uh, the, the work will be quite easy. We can just use uh, those element occurrence that is already uh, um, a, a spatial analyze and an identification of important sites and just uh, easily identify the key BAs. And we can even automatize that method so it will be uh, quite uh, easy to identify the key BAs in Quebec. But the reality is that um, the identification of key BAs needs much more uh, work than that. Um, we uh, need more data and uh, analysis, analysis to calculate the thresholds and meet the requirement of the KBA standard. Um, for example, we need uh, to have uh, an idea of the global or national uh, population of the species. We need to know if the species have been uh, well documented, if the field work uh, to find the species uh, was sufficient to be able to estimate uh, the population, etc. So uh, finally, the work is uh, taking much longer than we thought, and it, need, it needs more um, more analysis. But it's uh, uh, the interesting part of that is that we need to uh, talk to a lot of people that have a very uh, fine uh, knowledge about species to be able to have the information we need. So the other uh, data source that we are using, we are of course using the database of the Canadian Kidney Coalition that, uh, that identified over 500 species uh, in the territory of Quebec, many species that might trigger uh, the A1 criteria, so uh, for um, sites for threatened species. 
Uh, see, this is uh, one of uh, the primary source of information to start our analysis. We are also using uh, the information found in the, in the COSIWIC report, the critical habitat of species at risk, the EUC and red list of threatened species, a lot of literature review, and a very precious um, data source is the knowledge uh, of experts mainly experts that have um, knowledge of the fieldwork effort, of the sites, of a very fine knowledge about some species. So um, we have been uh, talking to uh, many people to be able to uh, identify a shorter list of uh, species to, um, to uh, concentrate our effort on and also to identify sites. Next slide, please. So um, up to now, we have uh, identified three group of KBA, I would say. So we have explored uh, the hotspot of, um, for endemic species in Quebec, like the Chicxeb Mountains or uh, the St. Lawrence Fluvial Estuary. Um, we have also uh, identified sites in or around national parks from Park Canada because of very because of um, uh, uh, um, very good interest, a uh, high uh, interest about, um, from Park Canada people to participate in the initiative. We have met a lot of uh, ecologists from Park Canada and Quebec, um, and we also have identified. Um, most of the KBA for vascular plants because we had the chance to have a very good collaboration with the botanist working for government of Quebec that uh, have been um, um, help us to um, shorten the list of species and uh, pinpoint the sites we needed to um, focus on. So next. Sorry, Kim, I think we'll have to uh, stop there for now um, for an interest of time. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's OK. OK. Um, hopefully we can come back to some of your examples in the discussion period. OK. Thank you. Um, so next up, we have uh, Juan Zuluaga, who is going to be talking to us about scoping KBAs identified for the highest ecological integrity. And Juan is a postdoctoral fellow at McGill University working with Andy Gonzalez. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. I have yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Jamie, for, for organizing this uh, webinar. Um, today, I would like to talk about uh, the process and, that, uh, and some of the results that we are doing um, at McGill, but with the, 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 the people working in, in trying to implement this uh, ecological integrity criterion C to help in this process of identifying key biodiversity areas in Canada. First, uh, I just want to mention, and I just want to complete the list of people that and the list that uh, Chiara showed us before, because it's a group of people uh, all across Canada just um, trying to contribute to this um, process of identifying Kiva um, uh, uh, diversity areas using implementing this uh, criterion C. We organized uh, several workshops and last year and 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 and. and at the beginning of this year, and uh, we organize um, teams. Uh, um, people put ideas on the table about how to measure ecological integrity, and also um, um, they compile uh, data sets and also developed uh, some metrics in order to to measure ecological integrity. And this list is going to grow because we are going to move to the second stage. I'm going to show that in a second we are going to move to the second stage. So, and this list is going to grow for people in co making contribution to this process. 
So I, I just want to focus on, on this. I'm not going to describe what is a, a key VA, but I, I'm going to focus on, on this slide because uh, um, the, the talk today is about ecological integrity. And if we summarize in the, in the, in the standard and the guidelines, we are looking for large areas in Canada, more than 10,000 square kilometers, that's the guidelines, and maximum two areas per, per acre, and that's our, our, our target. And we are looking for two, two main uh, characteristics in, in those areas. The first one is uh, low human pressure and the second one is high biotic integrity. So that's the, the, the challenge that, that we have uh, now. But let me describe before going uh, through the process uh, uh, in detail uh, how we approach this. We, we have to basically two steps. The, the, the first one is more like a macro analysis, desktop analysis. I'm going to show you some results about this because we are going to move to the second one, which is more the regional analysis using local data, including indigenous knowledge and also integrating some um, additional information about other criteria. So this is the, the general process that we have, starting from the scoping analysis and then the assessment. So in the macro analysis, we try to tackle three of them. The first one is the scoping analysis, trying to use all the data sets and that we have about human pressure, trying to identify those candidate areas. And the second one, the assessment is a, is a more like macro assessment, trying to include this biotic component. And then we, 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 we have a lot of data that we think that it can be useful for, for to help in the in the next steps, the selection and delineation. In the more local uh, regional analysis, um, and they are going to go back area by area, like side by side, in order to to incorporate more local and uh, data about the biotic component, and then move to the selection and delineation process, and um, taking into account the the analysis that we did before about those special considerations. So one of the things that that uh, the people uh, that, that the group proposes is trying to integrate not only terrestrial um, um, data sets and metrics, but trying to integrate the, the, the aquatic ecosystems, in particular freshwater. We, 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 we didn't have uh, uh, the time uh, to integrate marine ecosystems, and I think that one is going to be uh, another, another uh, work um, in parallel. So let me share with you some results about this uh, macro analysis, because that's the, 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 the analysis that we have right now. And but first, the target that we have is uh, we, we, we need to identify two sites per, per ecoregion, and we have uh, roughly 45 ecoregions in, in Canada. But also, we are going to use the hydro basins as subunits, um, building units. Uh, uh, in part for the lineage in particular. You won't see a lot of um, details uh, right here, but, but keep in mind that uh, we are using ecoregions as a big unit, trying to identify two sites, two areas for a per ecoregion, and also the hydro basins as a building blocks in order to, to build those uh, sites. So for the scoping analysis, um, we, we, we did like review a lot of metrics, uh, global, uh, uh, metrics and, and data sets and also national metrics and data sets. And the main conclusion of that evaluation is that uh, they, they are like coarse resolution uh, for, for Canada. Uh, and we needed to, to, to do something about that. So we decided to create the human footprint for Canada and also compile regional data sets in, in Canada. So for the human footprint of Canada, uh, we did uh, uh, um, uh, a new human footprint uh, map for Canada, 300 meter resolution. It's based on the, the previous work of Oscar Venter and other people from uh, a global analysis, and this one is a, a, a thousand meter re resolution. So we have a new human footprint, let's say the version one of the human footprint for Canada. Then the next question was, OK, what could be considered the low human footprint for Canada? So there is empirical evidence that um, below uh, two, uh, we can have a, a, a low human footprint. So this one is the, the, the areas that we have uh, uh, left when, when we use um, a human footprint below. And number two, so uh, it's not. Uh, uh, um, it's clear that in the south of, of Canada we have a high pressure um, human activities in in Canada. 
So we are playing with uh, uh, even relaxing the, the threshold three, four to see what is going to be the effect and uh, the stability of these regions. Uh, um, but um, just to mention that um, they are very stable when when you relax the, the, the threshold. But we are running this kind of analysis. Then we, we thought, OK, it's not enough to have uh, um, this uh, human footprint for Canada because we run in parallel these um, projects. So uh, Lucy, uh, she made an amazing job just collecting provincial data set, in particular roads, and then also seismic lines that are important features in, in, in the landscape. And also we um, extracted uh, this uh, this um, this uh, data set from from the forest landscape integrity in this to identify the forested area in Canada then a group of people uh, just created this uh, river connectivity index to to give for more like the the freshwater perspective of, of the connectivity of 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 the hydro basins in this case for instance you see the dark blue is a high connectivity and the red um, hydro basins are um, low connectivity so when when you move from from the previous map from the human footprint map to integrating all these data sets so the picture is a little bit different so um, we think that we have a, a, a comprehensive um, data set for human pressure in, in canada and from there we we can start just trying to identify look what we call candidate areas within the core region so in this process of cleaning and, and organizing the, the, the this data set and based on the human pressure, we have 71 potential candidate areas within 25 ecoregions in, in Canada. So this is this is the, the scoping analysis. Then we move some, to some kind of, of assessment and uh, macro assessment. Uh, and also we we had uh, we reviewed a lot of uh, global and national data sets and metrics to evaluate if they can be useful to measure uh, biotic intactness in Canada. So one of the main conclusions that we have is the, 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 the metrics that we have uh, uh, globally and nationally and uh, data sets and metrics, they are a function of human footprint. So, so it's if we use that, we are like counting twice the the, the, the metrics. So, so and this is an issue uh, um, and to apply those those metrics. So we decided uh, to develop and uh, try to develop uh, some metrics uh, at, at this macro macro scale. So the team of um, Freshwater they developed uh, this fish biodiversity index and that we are going to use uh, uh, in the assessment we we play with some data uh, of uh, faunal extirpation in, in canada and we also develop this in by uh, birds integrity index to inform the selection and, and the lineation because the 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 the, the, the the first idea that we have is that we can use this um, by birds integrity index in the assessment, but this one suffers also the, the same problem with the global metric that is a function of human footprint. But we think that it is, it's going to be very, very important to, to inform the selection and delineation. We explore also some metrics that the, like the spectral diversity in this. We did a pilot project in, in Quebec, but it's going to take more time in order to, to do some kind of um, natural metric. Then the, 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 the freshwater team just proposed like a lake and river biotic uh, uh, index um, and, and, and it's going to be a challenge is collecting data from from the provinces in order to have some kind of national um, indices uh, so um, here I want to say that even uh, we didn't use some data because we have some taxonomic and geographic bias we are going to use those data sets in, in the in, in the second stage, which is going to be more regional uh, analysis using using local data sets uh, um, there. But for 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 the macro analysis, it was hard to compile um, and, and data data for for the biotic company. So let me show you uh, this example uh, quickly. I'm running out of time right now. Yeah, I have like one minute. Okay. Yeah, one and minute. This is the. OK, this is the fresh water, fresh water um, um, bio, fish biodiversity index. And uh, I, I'm just want to, to show you that um, 
the, the, the team just created this fish biodiversity index using the original native uh, species composition and the current composition, and, and they created this uh, jacquard dissimilarity, dissimilarity index. And you see in uh, blue uh, areas, dark blue areas, it's where you have no change in those um, fish assemblages. Let me just finish with, uh, with uh, some conclusions because I'm running out of time. So the approach we develop integrates terrestrial and aquatic, uh, but not doesn't consider in marine ecosystems. Uh, we develop a comprehensive human pressure data set for Canada. Sorry, we identify 71 potential candidate areas within 25 ecoregions from which sites can be selected with uh, local data. Uh, the most available, uh, most available biotic intact metrics are a function of human pressure, so they limit the, the use to measure ecological integrity based on this macro analysis. We developed the, the fish biodiversity index as a first proxy to measure ecological integrity in Canada, and the biotic integrity will be best evaluated during the regional, regional site selection workshops that we are going to, to, to run in the coming months. That's all I have, um, Jamie. Thank you so much, Juan. Uh, so next, we are going to hear about the National KBA database that's in developed by Andrew Couturier from Birds Canada. And Andrew is the Senior Director, Landscape Science and Conservation. Thanks, Jamie. I think I've managed to unmute myself and I hope you're seeing my screen now. Yes, looks good. Thank you. OK. Um, so I'll just uh, take a minute here to, to th first thank you, Jamie, for organizing this session and uh, WCS for hosting this. Um, and I, I do want to thank um, the, all of the members of my team at Birds Canada who have worked so hard on what you're about to see. Uh, especially Dean Evans, who is our uh, KBA data guru, uh, working on, on all of this, but also Amanda Beekle and uh, Sandra Marquez, and the entire uh, WCS team as well, who has been working hand in hand with us, um, figuring out um, various issues of how to display data and uh, criteria and so on. There's a, an enormous ongoing list of things that we're working on. Um, but just to say it's been a team effort um, that I'm presenting to you today. And what I'm going to do is just run you through a kind of sneak peek under the hood of um, what we are working on in terms of a, a web portal and interactive database that um, will house all of the KBA sites in Canada as they come in. Um, this has been modeled um, more or less off of the very successful and long running important bird and biodiversity areas um, system that Birds Canada has been running for more than 20 years. And so don't worry about, you know, what you even what you see on the screen right now, the words are going to change, the, the graphics are all going to be swapped out and, and all of that. But I really want to just focus on on just giving you a quick demonstration of the, the three different ways that um, we're developing to uh, query the data and interact with the data, download the data, and those types of things. Um, more goodies will come later, but for now, I will uh, just dive into um, a quick tour of these three functions that we've been working on quite heavily over the last uh, so 10 months or so. Uh, so first of all, there's a map viewer page here, um, uh, a quick way to get an overview of all the all the sites in Canada that have been identified to date. And again, just a reminder here, what we have on the screen right now is solely the um, the IBAs that have been assessed for KBA status and which look very good for KBA status. Um, Kira mentioned these in her opening slides as the 192 that look very good for KBA status based on the data we do have. We do have a big um, challenge um, with data deficiency, um, old data, uh, one time occurrence of of records and those kinds of things and we're working towards uh, filling those gaps and that'll be an, an ongoing process for some time. But for the moment we have these 192 sites that we can we can just use to demonstrate what the site is going to look like. 
So this is a standard kind of web map, zooming in and zooming out and so on. But what's quite neat about it at the top here is that I can um, type in provincial codes and it'll filter out the results and just zoom right to uh, a particular province if I enter a province code. Um, or if I enter, if I happen to know the name of a site, I'm familiar with the site, um, it will zoom right to, to that site, in this case, the Fraser uh, Estuary in British Columbia. And then of course, any, uh, any polygon can be clicked on and it brings up more information. And a link goes off to the more detailed site summary page, which um, I'll show you right now. Again, this is a, a placeholder design. There's a new design actually in the works right now to make this look a lot nicer and sharper. Um, but for now, um, <clears throat> we have um, all of the info populated from the IBA database plus new information from uh, from our KBA assessment. And so as I scroll down here, um, standard kinds of things about um, what habitats are at the site, that what what the level of protection is, uh, threats and so on. Some goodies to link off to uh, other sources and uh, other sources of information and also um, ability to report data and contribute data, uh, in this case for eBird and iNaturalist, and we're working on a an exciting um, linkage with iNaturalist right now actually to set up uh, collector projects for all the KBAs in Canada as they are developed so that we'll then be able to to view um, any and all biodiversity information that exists within a KBA boundary. We are going to have a printable map, biodiversity plots um, and other goodies later. As I scroll down again, this is descriptive kinds of text that um, descriptive paragraph text that comes from the IBA database at the moment and that will perhaps need a little bit of a review at the bottom here we have a, a print page button which will create a, a very fancy um, PDF uh, publication essentially publication sheet out of this uh, page of information and then the more the most exciting part will be the data uh, the trigger species here as I said at the moment we only have bird data entered we haven't received um, the other biodiversity data yet for any of these KBAs but for birds we've uh, <clears throat> well we've got the whole system set up ready to receive other types of information for other taxonomic groups but at the moment we have have the bird data in here and um, and so you can see each li each line is a is a record for a, a particular species and which which criteria were met at the national level and the global level. Uh, remember, we do have the national standards, so we're applying um, KBA criteria at different levels. And there are links off. These these are these are links off to our species profile pages, which I'll get to in a second. So another way to find sites is through this uh, site search filtering system. Um, Again, it, it works the same way as, a, as the map does. You can type in a provincial code uh, or even a specific uh, site code if you know it, or the name of a place, etc. So long, long point should bring up, or that long should bring up long point. Um, and it brings back this, this little piece of information and then a link off to go to the the more detailed site summary. There are other fancier ways to filter over here, which I won't uh, get into too much, but just, uh, you know, you could click off uh, a particular province and it would show you all the all the sites in that province. KBA status, whether it's a global site or national. Um, you could for you could search by habitat and you can combine all these things together as well so that um, the list gets shorter and shorter depending on what you've asked for. And then if you're a real keener and you really understand the criteria, you can go through and uh, select a particular criterion that you're interested in and, and only show those sites um, for that particular criterion and the same for national. And another neat feature here is, um, so if I did something like that, I could uh, 
filter out just the national sites. There are 56 of them according to this, and then I just click on this button view on map, and it'll bring up um, it'll bring up all the national uh, national KBA sites. Same thing for any any filter that I might apply. There's the option to view it on map. And eventually we'll have this option where you can download uh, a shape file of the results or a CSV table listing the results. Um, so that's quite cool. And then our third way of interrogating the database is through a species search function. Again, you could use these filters on the side uh, and we only have bird data, so this one isn't particularly relevant at the moment, but if I only wanted to see amphibians, I could click that box and it would only show me the species um, and those that belong to that group. Similar with, thank you, Jamie, one minute left. Uh, similarly, I could search only for particular types of uh, globally listed species according to the IUCN Red List. I could search by NatureServe ranks. I could search by Kosiewicz status, etc. And so, um, and again, if I did that, uh, actually, uh, let me do that. Um, whoops. If I did endangered, gives me seven records, and there, there are the records, there are the birds. And then if I say view on map, this should show me all the KBAs. Yep. Oh, no, I don't think that's working. <laughs> and maybe that feature is not working yet, but um, it should give me a list of all the KBAs at which that that grouping of sites, uh, species rather, occurs. Also search for um, particular species in here if I know what they are. Dev key, for example, click on the card, and then it brings me to this uh, nicely formatted page that gives me all the information on that particular species. An option to view on map. This one happens to occur at 16 or 17 different KBAs. View on the map, brings back the map showing only those sites. And there are links off to other sources and so on. So. And with that, I think I better stop before I get the hook here. Um, but just to say um, these are some of the features that we're, we are working on and uh, and there'll be a lot more to come. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, Andrew. It looks great. And just a reminder for everybody to go ahead and put any questions you might have in the chat box. And uh, next up, we're going to hear about building on IBAs towards KBAs in BC from Liam Reagan, who's the Provincial Coordinator of the BC IBA program at BC Nature. Awesome. Hi, Jamie. Hi. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, I, I cut back a little bit because I know we're running late on time. And I think Andrew did a really good job summarizing the work that's already been done uh, on it, identifying IBAs that already qualify as KBAs. Let me just share my. PowerPoint real quick. Um, sorry. Yeah, so as Jamie said, I'm the provincial coordinator of the Important Bird and Biodiversity Areas program here in uh, BC. And I'm coming to you from the traditional territories of the Lekongwen speaking peoples in Victoria. Um, so yeah, the, BC, or the IBA program has been in BC for 25 years through a partnership between Birds Canada and BC Nature and includes 83 IBAs currently being evaluated for KBA st uh, status as part of the crosswalk uh, process initiated by Birds Canada of reviewing all data for those IBAs. Um, the thing that I always like to really bring into this is that in BC, a really, really fundamental piece of the program has been the IBA caretaker network, which involves over 60 dedicated volunteers and about 30 plus uh, clubs and organizations who sponsor IBAs and uh, take the lead on everything from monitoring and surveys to stewardship to public outreach and who over the past uh, I guess quarter of a century now have been really the, the force behind the IBA program. It has allowed us to uh, keep up to date on what's happening, monitor threats, uh, raise public awareness around the sites and what's so critical to them, and conduct stewardship efforts to make sure that we're able to mitigate any threats to habitat. Uh, so huge thanks to all those volunteers uh, and all they've done to get the program to the stage that we're currently at. Uh, and in part, uh, when so when the Birds Canada released their IBA KBA crosswalk for birds earlier this year, uh, it was noted that BC had uh, some of the most robust data of uh, the various provinces, and that's attributable to the IBA caretaker network. Uh, I know many other provinces also have caretaker programs, 
as well. Uh, and so thank you to those volunteers um, in turn. Uh, of the 83 IBAs, as you can see, based solely on the pre preliminary data, uh, 27 qualified as either a national or global KBA right off the bat. 39 were shown to be data deficient, meaning that they had some records which met thresholds, but that those records were either from a single year, single observation, or out of date. And 17 had no preliminary qualifying data. Um, I'll get into that a little bit on the next slide, but essentially a big problem which we've seen echoed across Canada with data deficiency is that most, uh, many of our more remote IBAs uh, specifically in BC coastal sites for either uh, breeding storm petrels or uh, marbled merlets were surveyed by CWS in the 80s and 90s without much intensive survey there since. That's a really large obstacle for us in that to go back out to many of those coastal sites uh, and conduct intensive marbled merlet surveys, for example, is incredibly cost prohibitive. And so we're currently looking at how we can approach that and show in sites where there's been no major habitat degradation um, and no reason to believe that marble merlet populations would have dipped below thresholds, how we can how we can still assess that and prove that they do still meet KBA qualifications. Um, so the plan going forward is to first off assess for missing data uh, that was left out of Birds Canada's review uh, and put forward new data where available. Uh, as I'm sure many of you have run into many uh, birders and volunteers can sometimes keep their uh, databases in you know Excel format or even in written notes, things like that, uh, which is really crucial data, but obviously doesn't get put into formats that we're able to review for KBA qualification. Uh, we know a number of cases like that where there is either unpublished papers or caretakers who have massive you know decades worth of data that hasn't been submitted in formal formats. Um, that we'll be uh, using to assess the data deficient and no preliminary qualifying data sites uh, to put forward as KBAs. Once we've done that, we'll be able to determine uh, sites which did qualify, which were excluded from the initial assessment and sites which still we don't have qualifying data for. Once we're at that stage, the plan is to review those for KBA potential with the IBA steering committee in BC which is made up of expert representatives from BC Nature, Birds Canada, BC Field Ornithologists, and uh, just various ornithological experts in British Columbia. Uh, so those will be able to parse out. We know we've determined some previous IBAs have, for various reasons, either degradation or changing thresholds with, popula or with bird population changes. We don't believe they will qualify. That's in the minority right now. Uh, one I can point out, uh, we know that when bald eagle numbers began to rise after the banning of DDT, many of the heron rookeries, which uh, had spread out across the coast into smaller rookeries, are now reconglomerating into larger rookeries. Uh, and so we had a few IBAs dot <clears throat> pardon me, dotted along the coast, which now we think, OK, they, they've mostly moved out. They don't meet thresholds. We, uh, we can look at what the next stage is for the site are. Um, but with the majority, which we identify as, OK, we don't have the data, but we do think this still has threshold numbers. We then need to uh, work with our provincial partners and Keeley First Nations Guardian programs to conduct surveys at those sites. Um, I specifically mentioned First Nations Guardian programs here because uh, thanks in large part, uh, or almost exclusively, to a grant from Nature, from a grant from Nature Canada, we have in the past been working uh, extensively with various coastal First Nations on models for partnering with Guardian Watchman programs to both do uh, bird survey training and uh, rely on their expertise of the area and uh, resources and Keeley ability to get to many of these remote sites to survey them. Uh, the two First Nations that we work the most with have been the Comox First Nation and Haida First Nation. Uh, because, as I mentioned, because many of these sites are remote coastal sites, that's going to be a real driver for us is finding out which need to be reviewed and then if there are First Nations Guardian programs in the area who want to partner with us. Um, so that's kind of a, a big impetus going forward. Um, and yeah, like I said, I cut out the bits talking about the ones that did qualify. So um, yeah, so then, yeah, so our key supporters, I've listed them here. But um, that's where we're at with assessing IBAs for KBA status in British Columbia. As I mentioned, we have a huge number of surveys that we need to run. Uh, we have our first one specifically targeted at gaining data for the KBA program coming up this Sunday. 
thanks to uh, funding from BC field ornithologists. Uh, we also have received funding from TD Bank, Nature Canada, uh, CWS, and of course, BC Nature and Birds Canada, which we're incredibly grateful for and have allowed us to do this and continue to do this. So yeah, thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to my talk. And as I mentioned, if anyone has any questions, please, or as Jamie mentioned, please put questions in the chat. I'll drop my email there if anyone wants to follow up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liam. Okay, our last speaker for today uh, will be talking to us about how KBAs will conserve biodiversity. And this will be by Sherman Boats. Uh, Sherman has long been a biodiversity practitioner, working on many initiatives, including COSEWIC, the Canadian Biodiversity Strategy, the General Status of Wildlife Programs, Species at Risk Legislation, and many others. He is a strong supporter of the KBA program in Canada and is a national advisor for the project. And I'll share your presentation for you, Sherman. Thank you very much, Jamie. So uh, before we begin, I, we just had a couple of hours of, uh, of uh, great information about KBAs, but just wanted to remind everybody why we're here. Um, uh, biodiversity that's ever present around us every day uh, really reminds us of the importance of programs like the KBA. Me in particular, I've been uh, watching uh, Pyractomena borealis, one of the boreal fireflies the last few nights. And it's just amazing the displays that we're having this year. So let's keep in mind uh, biodiversity is, is a very tangible and critically important thing. And the KBA is an important tool that we're going to use to support uh, biodiversity conservation. So I didn't name the talk um, if um, biodiversity areas will conserve uh, biodiversity, but rather how. And uh, hopefully we've seen today a huge amount of interesting and detailed science work around KBAs, but I'm thinking more and more and interested in how we're going to use this science to uh, make key biodiversity areas an important part of biodiversity maintenance and persistence. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of biodiversity conservation context in Canada, and I've uh, been involved with this for a long time, since 1995. And I think it's interesting to, to learn a few lessons just from that broad context. We spent the first maybe 10 years just trying to tell people what biodiversity is. We kept getting uh, stumped with that question. So it's really cool that in the KBA program, we're working from what is biodiversity to where is it? And I think that's a very powerful tool that I hope will help us figure out how to uh, support the persistence of it. In Canada, in terms of biodiversity, even though we've had this by broad biodiversity brush, we've had uh, a lot of emphasis on species at risk and protected areas. So I'm really excited about this new tool, as you'll see. It's taken us 25 years to get from when we started talking about biodiversity to where we are today. So I just wanted people to keep that timeline in mind because even though in a couple of years we're going to have an amazing data source to influence biodiversity conservation, it's going to take a long time to integrate it into what's going on. And the last uh, bit of text at the bottom of that slide just is my description of what was a very strong and positive uh, approach to both biodiversity and species at risk. That's kind of how we've done it. There's a strong cooperative government approach, but a huge non-government involvement as well. Next slide, please. So um, I won't go through this, but um, we've given quite a lot of different presentations emphasizing how this is a, a very, not just a new tool, but a powerful biodiversity conservation tool globally and nationally. So these points just uh, indicate that. Next slide, please. So key biodiversity areas, what are they, why? Um, the important thing that we need to remember is that they're not just places on the map where we can look up species and stuff. They're supposed to contribute to the global persistence of biodiversity, so we have to keep that in mind. Um, 
the identification and the delineation is important, but how are we going to use that, that science? So we've already seen today, we've got standards, we've got a community of people, database, websites, uh, all kinds of tools, but how are we going to maximize how those will be used in a Canadian context to support biodiversity conservation? We keep coming up against a little bit of a bump because people are always qualifying KBAs by saying they're not meant to be protected areas or they're not protected areas. So we need to figure out ways that without this sort of black and white management prescription that we can figure out how to uh, use them to our best effect. Next slide, please. Uh, we heard from Courtney earlier, and I'm well familiar from this from species at risk and biodiversity work I've done, but there are these very high level tangible uh, points towards KBAs as important tools that we can use. But these are largely high level and largely general or symbolic, and the challenge will be to how to move this forward in a more tangible way. Next slide, please. This is a slide that Kira and I put together a, a while ago for a general presentation on KBAs. And I'm not gonna go through it here, but I just put it in to show you that we talk about this knowledge layer of biodiversity that we've had a kind of a brainstorming session and have thought all different kinds of ways that in a general sense, the KBA information could be used to influence conservation decisions and conservation planning. So here's just a, a hit list of some of those. One of the other things I think is important is we need to think about how active or passively we want to be in promoting conservation within KBA sites. The identification and delineation is an important part of it, but we could just stop there and just see what happens, or we could actively engage and uh, promote KBAs much more actively. Um, next, please. It's worth mentioning out uh, the role of governments. I mean, there's been a very good government support for KBAs in a general sense, but I think one of the things that stand out about the KBA approach is just already how much involvement there is outside of government in this a KBA project. Another thing I think we know from the history of, of Canada, how long it takes to make policies and how long it takes to make legislation, uh, whether you're talking locally or you're talking nationally, it can be very difficult and take a long, long time. So we may want to look at less formal ways to influence policy and legislation around things that might include KBAs. So inserting uh, in existing documents and programs, um, things about KBAs might be a useful approach. I don't think we should be small-minded about it, though. Um, there's a lot of interesting work in the world right now about thinking about how, for example, rivers should be given a certain amount of rights, analogous to human rights, that would support the important role that biodiversity plays. So we should be thinking innovatively around KBAs from that perspective as well. Next slide, please. So I just put together two slides that are just around some examples of things that we might do even before we complete the work on identifying and delineating the areas, how we might start to think about how we can raise awareness and support the protection of biodiversity with KBAs. And I'm sort of staying away from the usual sort of stakeholder list of groups and individuals and thinking that maybe a better approach would be to look at sort of organizational level, uh, science, uh, community, and culture. So you'll see that in these two slides. And I, I won't go through them all in the interest of, uh, in the interest of time, but um, I will uh, go over a couple of them. So we know that a lot of the uh, key biodiversity areas are situated on existing protected areas, but we also know that there's a lot of um, protected areas, or sorry, KBAs that are on private land. Um, 
organizations are already participating in the coalition, but one of the things I think we need to talk about is helping people understand or determine how they can play a, a more key role in that. I think we can make some direct, direct linkages between funding and budgets with KBAs. And also there's a lot of targeted um, land acquisition programs and stewardship programs across the country. And I think we could, rather than just let that happen, we could try and stimulate that a little bit. In terms of science, I think uh, we already have a lot of the science community engaged, but uh, we could encourage research by uh, linking research funding to KBAs. I think a great way would be to provide scholarships or internships even to very young students who might someday go on and do graduate work in KBA related work and, and, and be champions for that. Next slide, please, Jamie. In terms of the uh, uh, community, I've already mentioned landowners, but we could provide incentives for landowners, private landowners to acknowledge the presence and the importance of KBAs uh, that their lands associated with. Uh, I think the, the idea of, of, of the branding and some visibility on the ground, we need to have signs and maps that show people where these things are, not just have them as abstractions on, on the website. Finally, I think a very important point of view, and I learned this from our work on biodiversity and species at risk, is it takes a long time to weave um, a new concept or tool into the, the Canadian culture. So I think we need a, a good branding of, of KBAs, and we already have a, quite a bit of that work done. We have champions already, but there's lots of room for most more champions, both as individuals and organizations. In Canada, that can go a long way to, to getting uh, KBAs uh, used more widely. And finally, you know, we need to make the KBA word a regular a uh, term that comes up in kitchens and pubs across Canada. So people know the names of the KBAs and they know uh, the KBAs that they, they live near. Um, one more slide, I think, uh, Jamie, or two more. So one of the things I want to just mention very quickly is that we have had contact with Indigenous people and First Nations in, in, in quite a limited capacity. Um, but we don't really know the extent, I don't think, in Canada that First Nations are broadly have a, an interest or, or realize that they might have utility for the KBA approach. So I think that's worth pursuing. And also, of course, traditional ecological knowledge. There may be non-traditional sources of data that may be really important in terms of the KBA process. Next slide, please. And so I'm just going to wrap it up with one more slide after this, but we have this great community and you've seen some of that already. Um, but I look at this community as being broad, but very loosely connected. So one of the things we can talk about after uh, today's and in the future is how we're going to move forward with the utilization of KBA. So final slide, please, Jamie. So here's just a few uh, questions about coming back to the title, how key biodiversity areas will conserve biodiversity. So we need to move from, you know, where is the biodiversity to what we're going to do and encourage with these sites. I think also we have to be careful that we don't just assume that by identifying and delineating these that they will contribute to biodiversity persistence. We need to be able to measure and, and, and record that. Uh, where are we gonna focus, focus our efforts? How active do we want to take on the, the use of KBAs? And how fast uh, can or should we move forward? And final question and end of the talk really is just maybe you can spend a little bit of time. I know you all have a lot on your plates, but maybe you can think a little bit about whether you're involved the way you want to be, the extent you want to be, and uh, how you might uh, move that forward. So that's all I have, Jamie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sherman. Okay, we have a couple comments in the chat here we can look at. Um, Andrew has already 
commented on a couple of the things uh, regarding when our online database will be available. There's still quite a lot of work to do, so we're not quite sure about that yet. Um, Liam has gone ahead and shared his email address if anyone would like to con connect with him. And Amanda has also done so, um, who is also with Birds Canada. So our first question, and this isn't directed to anyone in particular, so any of our speakers feel free to chime in. Randy's asking, how flexible might KBAs be to natural or unnatural uh, disturbances, things like fire, natural succession, uh, oil spills? What happens when the habitat or trigger species are reduced but might come back? And will the KBA designation continue to help the conservation initiative? Yeah, I'd be happy to um, take that. Um, just, I'm not entirely sure how to interpret flexible, but basically all, all of these sites could, you know, be damaged and by identifying them, that's what we hope to avoid. Um, but certainly KBAs are meant to be reassessed every eight to 12 years to see if those sites still meet the requirements, uh, the criteria to be a KBA. Um, and there is the possibility for restoration in sites where um, species are in trouble. Um, and I think I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. But there's, there's more guidelines about that uh, from the global partnership. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody has chimed in here saying KBAs are not delisted automatically. If the trigger species or the criteria no longer trigger the criteria, then there's a period to reassess the site to see if it still meets criteria moving forward. Uh, here's a question from Michael, again, not directed to anyone in particular. Why the reliance of KBAs on species with restricted distributions? Are we justified in spurning or spurning commonly common broadly ranging species in favor of rare geographically restricted species? If one of the purposes of conserving 30% of lands and waters by 2030 is to protect with the life support system, then we need to conserve common natural species and ecosystems that drive photosynthesis, influence water and nutrient cycles, dominate food webs, and sometimes face high levels of decline. Rare biodiversity will not persist in biomes and landscapes where common species and ecosystems continue to diminish. I'm sure someone can jump in here. I, I can just start us off by saying that that's absolutely correct. And KBAs are not an answer to all environmental problems, but they are a site scaled approach to conservation and site scaled conservation approaches have been shown to work for many for for uh, allowing the persistence of species uh, into the future. And I want to draw attention to the Criterion C sites that Juan Zuluaga uh, presented his scoping work on, which are meant to, in fact, um, capture 10,000 kilometer uh, squared plus sites that do have these processes and that are big enough to maintain the natural processes that are required uh, for the maintenance of ecosystems and species. But certainly, this is one uh, approach to conservation. And if anyone else would like to join in, please do. So uh, please jump in if anyone would like to comment on that. Um, we uh, do just, we, oh. Yes, yeah, oh, I'll just uh, kind of chime in. Um, I mean, it's, it's one lens to uh, help in prioritizing conservation action, but it's, by no means the only, and and not even necessarily the most important lens, as you point out in your comments. Um, it's it's, you know, sometimes um, one argument works for one site, and and another argument works for another site, and and uh, some sites are el eligible for some, you know, kind of funding support or action, and and others, depending on the criteria of funding programs and that kind of thing, and and other times, uh, other times not. So. You know, you look at species at risk work versus, you know, representation approaches to protected areas. Uh, you you kind of need you need a, n a number of uh, of uh, tools in the toolbox and and kind of be able to work. You know, take opportunities as they as they emerge based on criteria that just uh, work.
Stephen Woodley is chiming in saying, we certainly need conservation beyond KBAs, but KBAs have high irreplaceability. Biodiversity is not evenly distributed. So I have allowed any of our participants to unmute now if anyone else would like to chime in. And uh, we have a question from Sean just asking if the presentations can be shared. Um, I think that's probably fine. I'll check in with all of our speakers. Uh, the Basaro, you have your hand up. You can go ahead. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Um, I just want to make a comment on the uh, importance of um, protecting common species. It's absolutely true. Common species need to be protected. Uh, but a key interpretation is that KBAs uh, are meant to represent uh, sites of global importance for the global persistence of species. It's very hard to identify a manageable unit that is also at the same time important for the global persistence of a very common species. Um, that is the main interpretation that I wanted to, um, to provide there. And that's, I think, the reason why common species are hard to fit in. Uh, the thresholds would need to be so small that uh, then you would have uh, virtually all of rarer species being automatically included. It's just a threshold issue. Great, thank you for that perspective. So we have just two minutes here. Oh, Sherman. Oh, just a quick point about the common species thing. Um, KBAs aren't targeting common species, but of course they would afford some protection for common species. The unfortunate part is we don't track common species very much. So we don't know the extent that they would benefit from KBAs. Mm -hmm. OK, I think we better start to wrap up then. Um, Kim, I apologize that you didn't get to finish up. Do you want to take a minute to give any thoughts about a summary of your work or um, any next steps for Quebec before we wrap up here? Um. Well, maybe just to uh, the, the the maybe just to see that we have like right now uh, 43 uh, sites um, done in Quebec, but we are still working on the delineation and uh, still more work, still more work will be done. But I'll put my uh, email on the chat, so if anybody is interested or would like to talk about the Quebec initiative, then you can uh, contact me, and um, I will be happy to share my slides. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I just want to say thank you again to all of our speakers who have joined us today and donated their time. We really, really appreciate all of these perspectives. And I think it's really great to show how many people are really behind this initiative. Um, I'll leave it there. We have recorded this session and we can make a recording available. Um, I will also check in with all of our presenters today to see if we can share their slides as well. Um, with that, I just want to say thank you again, everybody, for joining us. The recording will be available online, and I'll send out an email to the participants list. And so thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you.